And now Hugh Laurie continues his reading of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes has been approached by a Dr. Mortimer from Dartmoor about the mysterious death of his neighbour. Sir Charles Baskerville has been found dead in the grounds of his house, which overlooks the moor. Though the death was apparently from heart failure, in view of tales of a family curse, the doctor was alarmed to see the footsteps of a gigantic hound not far from the body. Holmes leaned forward in his excitement. You say the footmarks were some twenty yards from Sir Charles's body, but had not approached it. Dr. Mortimer nodded. There are many sheepdogs on the moor. No doubt, Mr. Holmes, but this was no sheepdog. The prints were enormous. What is the alley like? There are two lines of old yew hedge with a strip of grass on either side and a gravel walk in the centre about eight feet across. I understand that the yew hedge is penetrated at one point by a gate. Yes, the wicked gate which leads on to the moor. Now tell me, Dr. Mortimer, and this is important, the marks which you saw were on the path and not on the grass. No marks could show on the grass. They were on the edge of the path on the same side as the moor gate. Sir Charles had evidently stood there for five or ten minutes because the ash had twice dropped from his cigar. He'd left his footmarks all over that small patch of gravel, but I could discern no others. Sherlock Holmes struck his hand against his knee with an impatient gesture. If I had only been there, that gravel path upon which I might have read so much will have been long smudged by rain. Dr. Mortimer looked at him. There is a realm in which the most acute and most experienced of detectives is helpless. You mean the thing is supernatural? I did not positively say so, but I find that before the terrible event occurred, several people had seen a creature upon the moor which corresponds with this Baskerville demon, and which couldn't possibly be any animal known to science. They all agreed that it was a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral, I cross-examined the most hard-hearted countrymen who all tell the same story. I assure you, there's a reign of terror in the district, and it's a hardy man who'll cross the moor at night. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. Yet you must admit that the footprint is material. The original hound was material enough to tug a man's throat out, and yet he was diabolical as well. Holmes smiled. I see, Dr. Mortimer, that you've quite gone over to the supernaturalists. But if you hold these views, why come to consult me? Dr. Mortimer looked at his watch. To advise me, as Sir Charles's executor, what I should do with Sir Henry Baskerville, who arrives at Waterloo Station in exactly an hour and a quarter. He being the heir. Yes, on the death of Sir Charles we inquired for this young gentleman, and found that he'd been farming in Canada. From the accounts which reached us, he is an excellent fellow in every way. I speak now not as a medical man, but as a trustee and executor of Sir Charles's will. There is no other claimant, I presume? None. The only other kinsman whom we have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of three brothers of whom poor Sir Charles was the elder. The second brother, who died young, is the father of this lad Henry. The third, Roger, was the black sheep of the family. He came of the old masterful Baskerville strain, and was the very image, they tell me, of the family picture of old Hugo. He made England too hot to hold him, fled to Central America, and died there in 1876 of yellow fever. Henry is the last of the Baskervilles. In one hour and five minutes I meet him at Waterloo Station. I've had a wire that he arrived at Southampton this morning. Now, Mr. Holmes, what would you advise me to do with him?' Why should he not go to the home of his fathers? It seems natural, does it not? And yet, consider that every Baskerville who goes there meets with an evil fate. I feel sure that if Sir Charles could have spoken with me before his death, he would have warned me against bringing his sole heir to that deadly place. And yet it cannot be denied that the prosperity of the whole poor, bleak countryside depends on his presence. All the good work which has been done by Sir Charles will crash to the ground if there's no tenant of the hall. Holmes considered. 
In your opinion, there's a diabolical agency which makes Dartmoor an unsafe abode for a Baskerville. But surely, if your supernatural theory be correct, it could work the young man evil in London as easily as in Devonshire. For the time being, go to Waterloo to meet Sir Henry, but say nothing until I've made up my mind about the matter. Bring him to meet me here tomorrow morning at ten. After the doctor had left, Holmes returned to his seat with that quiet look of inward satisfaction, which meant that he had a congenial task before him. Going out, Watson? Unless I can help you. I knew that seclusion and solitude were necessary for my friend in those hours of intense mental concentration, during which he weighed every particle of evidence. By the time I returned that evening, the sitting room was filled with the acrid fumes of strong, coarse tobacco. Through the haze, I had a vague vision of Holmes in his dressing gown, coiled up in an armchair with his black clay pipe between his lips. Several rolls of paper lay around him. After you left, I sent for the ordnance map of this portion of the moor. He unrolled one section and held it over his knee. Here you have the particular district which concerns us. That's Baskerville Hall in the middle. I fancy the U Alley must stretch along this line, with a moor on the right of it. This small clump of buildings is the hamlet of Grimpen, where our friend Dr. Mortimer has his headquarters. Within a radius of five miles, there are only a few scattered dwellings. Here is Laughter Hall, where lives a Mr. Franklin. Here a house which I believe to be the residence of a naturalist by the name of Stapleton. There are two moorland farmhouses, then fourteen miles away, the great convict prison of Princetown. Between and around these scattered points extends the desolate, lifeless moor. The setting is certainly a worthy one, if the devil did desire to have a hand in the affairs of men. I was surprised. Then you are yourself inkling to the supernatural explanation. He shrugged. The devil's agents may be of flesh and blood, may they not? There are two questions. The one is whether any crime has been committed at all. The second is, what is the crime, and how was it committed? Have you turned the case over in your mind? I nodded. I've thought a good deal of it, and I find it very bewildering. That change in the footprints, for example. Mortimer said that Sir Charles had walked on tiptoe down the alley after the gate. Holmes snorted. He only repeated what some fool had said at the inquest. Why should a man walk on tiptoe down the alley? He was running, Watson, running for his life, running until he burst his heart and fell dead upon his face. But running from what? There lies our problem. There are indications that the man was crazed with fear before ever he began to run. I'm presuming that the cause of his fears came to him across the moor. If the gypsy's evidence may be taken as true, he ran with cries for help. But why was he waiting by the gate? The evidence is that he avoided the moor. That night he waited there. The thing takes shape, Watson. The following morning, Dr. Mortimer came back with the young baronet, a small, alert man about thirty years of age. There was something in his steady eye and the quiet assurance of his bearing which indicated the gentleman. After Dr. Mortimer had introduced him, Sir Henry laid an envelope on the table. It was addressed to him at the Northumberland Hotel, and had been posted in Charing Cross the preceding evening. Holmes took out a half-sheet of paper. Across the middle of it, a single sentence had been formed by the expedient of pasting printed words upon it. It ran, "'As you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor.' The word moor was written in ink. Holmes glanced keenly at our visitor. "'Who knew that you were going to the Northumberland Hotel?' "'No one could have known,' said Sir Henry. "'We only decided after I met Dr. Mortimer. Perhaps you'll tell me, Mr. Holmes, what in thunder is the meaning of it, and who takes so much interest in my affairs?' Well, someone seems to be very deeply interested in your movements. Let's confine ourselves for the present to this document. Have you yesterday's Times, Watson? The inside page, please, with the leading articles. He glanced swiftly over it, running his eyes up and down the columns. I thought as much. You see the words, you, your life, value, all here, except for the word more, 
which is written in the original in ink. The type of a Times leader is entirely distinctive, gentlemen. These words could have been taken from nothing else. As it's a paper which is seldom found in any hands but those of the highly educated, we may take it that the letter was composed by an educated man. Now, if you examine the written address carefully, you will see that both the pen and ink have given the writer trouble, which leads me to believe that the writer was not using his private pen. Yes, I have very little hesitation in saying that if we examined the waste paper baskets of the hotels round Charing Cross until we found the remains of the mutilated times, we could lay our hands straight upon the person who sent this singular message. I'll ask a lad I know at the message office to do the task. Now, Sir Henry, has anything else of interest happened to you since you've been in London? You haven't observed anyone follow or watch you? Sir Henry looked amazed. I seem to have walked right into the thick of a dime novel. Why in thunder should anyone follow or watch me? We're coming to that, said Holmes. But first, you have nothing else to report. Sir Henry smiled. I don't know much of British life yet, for I've spent nearly all my time in the States, but I hope that to lose one of your boots is not part of the ordinary routine of life over here. I put a new pair outside my door last night. I've never worn them, and I wanted them varnished against the rain. In the morning there was only one. Well, I could get no sense out of the chap who cleans them, but I expect it'll turn up. Now, gentlemen, it seems to me that I've spoken quite enough about the little that I know. It's time you gave me a full account of what we're all driving at. Holmes then encouraged Dr. Mortimer to present the facts of the case, and when he'd finished, Sir Henry commented, I seem to have come into an inheritance with a vengeance. Of course, I've heard of the hound ever since I was in the nursery, but I never thought of taking it seriously. And now there's my uncle's death and this affair of the letter. It seems to show that someone knows more than we do about what goes on upon the moor, said Dr. Mortimer. And also, said Holmes, that someone is not ill-disposed towards you, since they warn you of danger. Unless they wish for their own purposes to scare me away. But there's no devil in hell, Mr. Holmes, and no man upon earth who can prevent me from going to the home of my own people. Now I should like a quiet hour by myself to think over all that you have told me. Suppose you and your friend Dr. Watson come around and lunch with us at two. We heard the steps of our visitor descend the stairs and the bang of the front door. In an instant, Holmes had changed to the man of action. Your hat and boots, Watson, quick! We hurried together into the street. Dr. Mortimer and Baskerville were still visible about two hundred yards ahead of us. He quickened his pace until we decreased the distance by half. Then we followed into Oxford Street and down Regent Street. Once our friends stopped and stared into a shop window, upon which Holmes did the same. An instant afterward he gave a little cry of satisfaction, and following the direction of his eager eyes, I saw that a handsome cab with a man inside had halted on the other side of the street. There's our man, Watson. At that instant, I was aware of a bushy black beard and a pair of piercing eyes turned upon us through the side window of the cab. Instantly, the trap door at the top flew up, something was screamed to the driver, and the cab flew madly off down Regent Street. Holmes looked eagerly round for another, but no empty one was in sight. There, he said bitterly, was ever such bad luck. It was evident from what we've heard that Baskerville's been shadowed by someone since he's been in town. We're dealing with a clever man, Watson, though I haven't finally made up my mind whether it is a benevolent or malevolent agency which is in touch with us. There's no further object in following our friends now. The shadow has departed. Could you swear to the face within the cab, Watson? Uh, only to the beard. And so could I, from which I gather that in all probability it was a false one. Well, it's a pity we didn't get the number of the cab, I commented. Holmes raised an eyebrow. My dear Watson, clumsy as I've been in allowing us to be spotted, you surely don't seriously imagine that I neglected to get the number. 2704 is our man. Hugh Laurie has been reading The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The programme was abridged and produced for Radio 2 by Jane Marshall Productions.